Thank you very much, Marcelo, for this introduction. Also, thank you to all of you for coming somewhat late at night to uh, late, late at the, of this day uh, to this lecture. So when Marcelo actually uh, asked me to uh, give a short presentation, I said immediately yes. And the reason is that I'm a big, big fan of the ITCP. I mean, it's, it's really uh, an amazing institution. I mean, it has been working for so many years. And, uh, you know, it's important as ever. I mean, so, so, you know, I was very happy to be invited. So thank you very much. So the task which I was given was to explain you in two hours something about the Carter parisi sang equation, uh, which uh, d d d doesn't seem to connect very much with uh, the rest of the program, at least as far as I could look at the various titles. But um, so I, I try to emphasize that, that there is this sort of underground connection between uh, what people just call KPC equation, I mean, Carter parisi sang equation, and quantum spin chains. And so this is sort of uh, what I'm trying to explain to the, these lectures. Okay. So let me, so the first slide uh, will be just sort of telling you even, I, I imagine that nobody has seen the KPC equation before at all. I mean, so let me just tell you very briefly what it is and why it was invented. Of course, the names are very famous, right? Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's a very specific work of theirs. So um, I'm going to look at this, uh, you know, it will be spin chains, I mean, which is obviously one dimensional, and correspondingly, the KPC equation will be actually in one dimension. You can write this down in any dimension. And of course, that's an interesting topic, but I mean, I'm just working here with the, so when I talk about KPC, I always mean the one dimensional KPC equation. And the original question which Carter Parisi Sang asked was a very simple physical question. So you imagine that you have a, a, a thermodynamic system um, and you prepare this, uh, and it has a sort of stable and beta stable states. And, uh, and you prepare the system uh, with an interface which touches the stable and the meta stable phase. So, like, like I don't know, a fluid and super saturated. Uh, Vapor, I mean, that would be sort of one example. I will have a more physical example a little bit later on. And now the question which they ask is, I impose this interface, and now is this interface moving? What kind of fluctuations would it have? And uh, the main observation is that, uh, you know, when you are at the interface, uh, then you can very easily nucleate uh, sort of, you know, a metastable piece into a stable one. I mean, if you are far out, I mean, the system is metastable, so it will stay in that particular state forever. But at the interface, you can very easily do the transition. And so what you will see is sort of like a net motion of this phase. I mean, there will be a net velocity, which sort of means that the stable phase uh, sort, of, uh, 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 sort of takes over the, the metastable one. And for that motion, they sort of wanted to write down an equation. And in order to simplify things, you see, can, you can think of domains or complicated things. So let's just imagine that this interface is given as a graph of a function. So this is my function h. There will be various h during this talk. But uh, here's my h. I mean, that's a function of x and of time, one-dimensional x, one-dimensional time. And you want to write down an equation how this uh, interface is evolving. And, uh, well, the idea was sort of, uh, you know, at first sight sort of uh, rather conventional. I mean, you, you look at the time change of age. I mean, that's sort of an evolution equation. And then what you would say is that, uh, look, I mean, there is, um, uh, at the interface, you will sort of randomly nucleate, but you will randomly nucleate more or less independently, and you will do this throughout space and time. So you, I put here a white noise, which is space-time white noise, right? So it's an x and t, and it's white in both variables. Well, and then, you know, there must be surface tension. I mean, there must be a mechanism which sort of ensures that this interface is not just getting immediately, you know, sort of extremely rough. And so this is usually sort of uh, uh, um, uh, embodied by, by putting here the Laplacian. And if I leave out the nonlinearity, I mean, you see you get a linear Gaussian equation which you can solve, and which in many cases, surprisingly, actually sort of works extremely well. But what they realized that is this, if you work in this one-dimensional context and if you have sort of the systematic rows, this is not what will work. I mean, you really have to put here, well, I mean, you could put here a linear term, just dx of h, uh, which sort of gives you, of course, a motion, but they realized that it's important to have this nonlinearity. And so, uh, you know, one can argue, and, and I don't want to do this here, but they just wrote down that in order to sort of, uh, uh, sort of include the systematic motion, you must have this very particular type of nonlinearity. So it's a stochastic partial differential equation. Okay. Now, this has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, and of course it will never have to do anything with quantum mechanics. 
But the surprising thing is that there's sort of a more mathematical identity, you know, sort of that, that things uh, which appear in quantum spin chains can be actually predicted to fall into the same universality class as this equation, right? I mean, so this is what I'm trying to explain. I'm not claiming that there's any connection in terms of sort of direct physical connection. It's sort of an indirect theoretical connection. So what I would like to explain to you is how to connect this kind of equation to quantum spin chains. Okay. Now, I, I divided my lecture into two parts according to the two hours. So the, the, the first hour will be connected with uh, Euclidean quantum mechanics. And so um, I'm going to look at the propagator e to the minus th. Uh, so t is real and, and h will be our quantum Hamiltonian. And then there will be the second lecture, which will be concerned with physical time, where I make, so this will be two very different connections. Where, um, uh, where uh, I look at the, at the unitary semi group e to the minus ith, and I will connect the quantum dynamics, some properties of the quantum dynamics to the KPC equation. Okay. Now, uh, literature, that's a little bit hard. You see, it's, it's an, a subject which has been sort of uh, uh, produced an enormous amount of interest. I mean, uh, uh, four years ago, Martin Heyer um, received uh, the Fields Medal in mathematics. Uh, and the title of, of one of his award-winning papers was Solving the KPC Equation. So, you know, if you're interested in very abstract and pure mathematics uh, <laughs> under the title of KPC, you can go there. But then you go to the other extreme. I mean, the experiments, which I sort of mentioned briefly, uh, also on the KPC equation. And in between, you know, there are lots of interesting stuff and still things going on. So I put here two titles, uh, sort of something which I wrote. I mean, you know, if you want to have sort of some sort of introductory, if you want to sort of look up more literature, but, but there, there's plenty. And there are books and all kinds of things. I mean, here I put sort of two lecture notes which, which, which I've written. Okay, so now let's see uh, the first thing. So now I first want to connect KPC equation to a Euclidean uh, quantum mechanical quantum spin chain. All right, now ask me any questions. See, I, I'm sort of not completely sure what exactly is your background. I mean, myself, I sort of have been working for many years in statistical physics and sort of mostly non-equilibrium phenomena, also a little bit of quantum mechanics and anyway. So, I mean, just, just ask me if there are questions. Okay, so, uh, so the first thing is I have to first describe you what, what, what the physics of, 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 uh, is, what, what, uh, what, uh, what is related to, the, um, uh, to the, this first linkage. So now I'm going to look at equilibrium shades of 3D crystals. I mean, this is a pure problem of thermal equilibrium. And uh, if you want to have a simple physical realization, you imagine that you have some hot substrate and you put whatever lead or you put some, some substance uh, a droplet of, 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 uh, of some substance on top of this substrate. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, we have, I mean, it, this is a solid. I mean, so you are below the melting temperature. And what you will see if I'm sort of at recent, you know, close to melting, I mean, you will see basically a droplet that has a particular shape, will be rounded. And then, of course, you know, it's an interesting equilibrium problem to minimize the surface tension so you can actually compute the shape of that droplet, okay? Now, as I lower the temperature, there will be one interesting physical phenomenon, namely that at, at some critical, and at some particular temperature, I mean, you will actually develop, uh, it will be no longer like a sort of smooth droplet, but you will develop actually completely flat pieces. These are usually called facets. Now, facet is actually a, a piece of your, of your crystal which is sort of, flat, I mean, sort of on the atomic scale. Of course, once in a while, you might have a little error. I mean, you know, an atom is here missing, or somewhere else I have an excess atom. But otherwise, it's sort of really completely flat. So when you're asking what are sort of the height fluctuations in your facets, it's really something which is of order one. It's sort of like, like something which is absolutely a perfect uh, ground state if you want so, and then there are sort of a little bit of errors on top of that, okay? Now, um, in the rounded piece, uh, uh, one can uh, argue that, that uh, I mean, you, you will see, so I'm interested in the, in the shape fluctuations. I mean, so I'm discussing at the moment just what is the macroscopic shape. But eventually, so I want to do statistical mechanics, which means that I want to see something about the shape fluctuations. Now, what one can argue fairly convincingly that if you see in the bounded phase, it will be quite universal. I mean, what you will see is sort of basically a simple Gaussian fluctuation theory. And, and when you work out, you know, what would be the covariance, then you see that you sort of discover 
uh, that it will be the inverse of the Laplacian. So it's something which people call a, a massless Gaussian field. So it will be actually have logarithmic fluctuation. It doesn't fluctuate very much, but sort of has logarithmic fluctuations. Now, of course, there are, there are coefficients which are related to the curvature, so let me let this out, okay? So now there's one other further interesting prediction, namely, you see, you could ask yourself, uh, you know, here I have uh, my facet and here I have the rounded piece. I mean, how does the rounded piece enter into the facet? Now, this was done in the 70s, and it's uh, usually people call it PT. I mean, so this is the prokopsky talapov law. And what they argue, actually, that uh, it will enter, you might think it will be just quadratic. I mean, that sort of looks like the nicest thing. But in fact, it will enter with an exponent r to this we have. And you will see this exponent sort of coming up over and over during the talk. OK? So that's, that, that's what we know about uh, the macroscopic shape. And now, in order to connect to the KPC equation, actually, I want to study a final fluctuation property. Namely, what I'm interested in is actually what are the shape fluctuations of the facet. You see, if I look at this thing from the top, so I will see my essentially round facet. So I'm now looking from the top. I have here this facet. And then I have level lines sort of which, which describe, you know, the, the, the you know, further parts of the crystal. So there will be one step below and that, et cetera, level levels of, the, of, this, of this height profile. And um, this means that, you know, if there's a facet here, there's sort of a last line which waters this facet. But this line, of course, will fluctuate. I mean, you know, there's no reason why it should just stay completely fixed. And so the question is, what are the facet edge fluctuations? That's a sort of a more refined um, uh, question which I'm asking. All right. And, um, and now let me show you a picture so that you can visualize what, what, what you do. So, Let's imagine that I'm looking now at, at, at an icing model in the lattice glass language. So I have atoms, and they have sort of this attractive interaction. Imagine that I'm at very, very low temperatures, and imagine that I have uh, n cube atoms. So n, n is an integer, uh, or is reasonably large. And now you ask yourself, what is the state of minimal energy? Well, everybody knows. I mean, that's a perfect cube. Okay. But now suppose I give you n cube atoms, and I take away uh, like, uh, I don't know, 10,000, right? Let's say n is, 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 uh, n is already itself 1,000, and I just take away 10,000 atoms, OK? So it's a small fraction of the total volume. And then you ask yourself, under the equilibrium measure, what kind of sort of shape will I see? And this is a computer simulation of what you will see. So you see that, so you should think of this sort of like, like a cube, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of just one, 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 one corner of that cube. Uh, you know, th these are the missing atoms, so they somehow have to arrange themselves, but they arrange themselves in such a way that they have three perfect facets and a rounded piece over here, which of course is fluctuating because it must have these Gaussian fluctuations. All right? And now you can see also, you know, this line structure, so, so this is just an enlargement of this piece over here. Here is the facet edge, okay? And then, uh, you know, this is sort of the level of the facet, and I'm one level below, there will be never line, next line. So you see, it gets sort of like a line ensemble, and this line ensemble have, has a particular statistics, and if I would understand the statistics of this line ensemble, then I could actually compute what are the, is the statistics of the facet edge, all right? So th this is what I'm thinking of. All right, now, uh, if you have a little bit of imagination, Mm, excuse me? Yes. Excuse me? Ah, previous slide, yes, uh, I can do that. No, that's the uh, wrong direction. Okay, this is the previous. What is? Uh, where, where are you? What is I? This, this, this symbol? Oh, yeah, okay, maybe, oh, sorry, oh, yeah, I should have said that. So, so this is the edge, and this is simply the, dead, the edge from the distance. So, 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 so this coordinate is called i. And what I'm saying is that the way how this enters into, into, the, into the flat part of the function goes with a power which goes r to the three halves. So, uh, sorry, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're, you're totally right. I mean, I should have done, said this more properly, okay? So, so it's this distance here, right? So if it would be parabolic, this would be r, r squared, right? And so it goes with powers we have. OK. Now let's see, where are we? OK, so now if you have a little bit of imagination and you have sort of seen sort of, you know, this relationship between uh, quantum spin chains and 2D statistical mechanics, you can sort of imagine that here I have already the world lines of fermions. And so, so maybe, maybe actually, you know, there is a rather close to connection to my problem 
to, uh, let's say, interacting fermions in one dimension, okay? So let's try to sort of uh, do this a little bit more precise. Um, so there is a famous model uh, amongst these uh, people who study crystals, um, which is called uh, the TLK or the Terrace slash Kink model, which sort of, you know, it's similar to what I had before, but I just want to explain this a little bit more precisely. So you imagine that you have a visceral surface. I mean, that's a surface which is perfectly flat, and now you cut it under a small angle. Right? And as you cut it under a small angle, then uh, typically you will see this, uh, and then you have thermal fluctuations. You will see, you know, the terraces, the latches, and the kinks. I mean, so here I, I've just shown a, a, a cross cut, which is sort of just the steps here. I mean, the, the various latches. Here I see from the top. I mean, so if I see from the top, then, then here I have the terraces. They have a certain height level, and they are bordered by the latches. So this is one latch over here. That's the next one. That's the next one. And then I have the kinks, which sort of saying is that, you know, the latches are simply, simply not straight lines, but once in a while they go down or you sort of go in one direction and then maybe they go up in other direction. That's, that's the terrace latch kink model. And now you want to sort of connect this to quantum mechanics. Well, you can do this. I mean, uh, you know, you, you just sort of think of, of the transfer matrix operating along this direction. And uh, maybe you, you, you write down uh, your, your, the, the XXC model. I mean, so here, this is the hopping term, and this would be sort of a repulsion of attraction between, uh, between uh, 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 sort of uh, latches, neighboring latches, and, and here sort of a parameter which controls uh, the, 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 the latch density. Anyway, so if you, if you, if you write down this, this quantum Hamiltonian, and then uh, you look at e to the minus tau h, then you can think of this as, as, and then you want to look at the propagator between some initial configuration X and some final configuration Y, then you can write this propagator by sort of, sort of you know, just uh, basically expanding out the H. You can write this propagator as a sum over all, over all weighted world lines. So I will tell something about the, the, the weight, but the world lines simply means that these world lines have to start at X, so they're over here, and at time tau, the final configuration must be Y. And then, you know, they must be connected by word lines according to a particular statistic, which, of course, encodes the properties of that quantum Hamiltonian. Or differently, I mean, the quantum Hamiltonian encodes the statistics of those word lines, right? So this is sort of one example of this, this you know, well-known map between uh, 1D uh, quantum spin chains and two-dimensional statistical mechanics. It's just one particular instance. All right, and now, now, now you have to sort of read off a little bit uh, what... what uh, uh, but what these world lines are doing. So, so the first thing what you observe is that, um, you know, because, because of the hopping term, uh, uh, you know, you have sort of like a, like a fermionic constraints, and because of the hopping term, the way how it's defined, I can, they can, cannot have two lines at the same size. So, so th these lines are constrained not to intersect, right? So it's a, it's a line ensemble of non-intersecting lines, which, of course, is an enormous constraint. I mean, so... If I, if I don't put the constraint, then I have just simple random walks. They're just symmetrically jumping up and down. That, that's this term over here. And, you know, they just have to find their way from, from X to, to the corresponding Y. But, uh, but uh, you, when you read this term carefully, you see that in codes, I mean, this constraint, and that's, of course, a huge constraint. I mean, it just modifies statistics of the line sort of entirely, right? Because now they cannot intersect. They would sort of violate, you know, the Fermi exclusion if they would intersect. And so... Then there, there is some extra weight, which, which comes from, from this term, which is diagonal in the sigma x representation. Uh, so you see this, I, I'm working here in the sigma, sigma, sorry, I'm working in the sigma c representation, right? I mean, this is the hopping between sigma c. It's the hopping between the occupations in, in, in the fermionic language or in, in the lattice gas language. And so in the sigma c, this is just a multiplication. And so, you know, if I, if I, put, uh, if I put this weight in the exponential, then you see that uh, what I get is I have to sort of uh, sum over all sides. I have to sum over all lines. There's a sort of nearest neighbor interaction between lines, and, you know, it will be a, a positive delta. It will be a weight delta, and still something similar for, for the corresponding weight uh, for the lines, uh, for, for which corresponds to the magnetic field. And so you see that if I put delta larger than zero, I mean, then, uh, you know, sort of uh, this heavily favors that lines are sitting together. If I put delta less than zero, it will be repulsive, so the lines want to sit apart. And, and the mu, which I have, controls the ledge density. Yes. 
What? Oh, sorry, this was in the previous slide. I mean, so what, what I, I sort of slightly skipped over that. I mean, so, so in order to have a simple notation, I call eta m the m's line. I mean, so this just means, you know, it's a line which is sort of one along, on, along this blue line and it's zero otherwise, right? I mean, it's just sort of, it's just a, an indication of, of, of one of those uh, world lines of the fermions. So sum over m simply means that I'm summing over all possible lines in, the, in, this, in this line ensemble. Yeah, that in the, it, it's, it's always in, in, in the basis where, where, where sigma c is diagonal. I mean, so, so you see that it means that, you know, if I look at the local thing that, that uh, you know, if this is, let's say, positive, then, then these two lines sort of like to stay together. And, and uh, how much they stay together depends how much time they actually stay together. You see, I mean, as soon as they sort of separate, I mean, then this term is simply turned off. So it just measures how long they stay together, and then if I give an extra weight to them, that means that, you know, I'm sort of favoring a sort of line sitting together. More questions? Okay, good, yes? No, no, further, the domain walls are still coming. I mean, this just represents simply the, the, the fermionic world lines. In, in Euclidean time, right? The hopping, the hopping, that's right. They just, just represent the hopping, right? And, 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 and the age tells me, you know, what kind of weight I should choose. All right, so let's see whether I can do this. So, so, so I put here this already. And um, uh, now, now, let's, now let's see what, what, um, uh, how we can produce a facet. You see, I just have told you this, this e to the minus th, and I can think of this as sort of a classical partition function. Uh, with, with fixed boundary condition. Now, now you see, in order, in order to, if I just prepare an equilibrium state, let's say, a, you know, a thermal state of my, of, of my XXY model or maybe a ground state, then, uh, you know, it will be spatially homogeneous. And if it's spatially homogeneous, I mean, I will not see any facets. So if I want to see facets, I have to impose some constraints. And the simplest constraints, what you do is, I mean, that's just like in the experiment, is that, you know, or, or also in the numerical experiment, I mean, you know, you have a fixed number of atoms. You know, I put here my, my droplet on my substrate, and this has a fixed number of atoms. Or, or in the Ising model, I, you know, I remove 10,000 atoms from my, from my Ising lattice gas. I mean, that fixes sort of the, 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 the number of atoms. This, of course, produces for you constraint. I mean, you know, I put it up there as a formula. But uh, for what I'm going to do, this is sort of, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I can do this also, but, but, but it's not so well understood. So I'm imposing the constraint by something else, which sort of was mentioned already, namely by, by something which is called the domain wall boundary condition. So let me sort of explain this um, um, uh, carefully. I mean, so, so the domain wall boundary condition basically means that, that I'm start so, so you see, this is your quantum state uh, at time t equals zero, and now it's evolving in Euclidean time. So at time t equals zero, I simply impose the domain wall state. This means that my left lattice, I mean, the way going to minus infinity, is simply occupied in every side. So occupation is always in terms of the sigma c basis, right? I mean, it's just sort of spin up if you want, so spin down depending what your convention is, okay? Whereas uh, the other half lattice is simply empty in my language, but, you know, you can also think of, of spin minus one, right? I mean, so this is the domain wall boundary condition. And now I, I impose exactly the same domain wall boundary condition at, at the final time. Okay, so these lines sort of start off with a perfectly, you know, sort of, you know, sort of, sort of with a perfect domain ball, and then they have some freedom to move, but then they are constrained to actually end up again in the domain wall at time tall. And now the question is, what am I going to see? Okay, well, you see, I mean, if I'm down here, I mean, you know, everything is constrained. I mean, these poor lines, I mean, they can nothing, nothing else do than to go from here to here. I mean, there's so much constraint that, you know, it's just, just no way. And also up here, there I have no lines at all. I mean, so clearly out here I will see the facet. But if I look here in the middle, for instance, look at this top line, you see it's, it's, it's constrained by the lower one, but you know, it can still move up. So there's something which people call entropic repulsion. Entropic repulsion just means that geometrically, you know, there's not enough space, and so it has to move up. And so the question is, how much does it move up? Well, it roughly moves up exactly on, 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 on the size of that system. I mean, just by order tall. Okay, and so if I'm now going to look at a very large scale, what you're going to see is sort of uh, 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 roughly a shape which looks like this. Out here I have the perfect facet, so these are just going straight from here to here. Here it's all sort of all empty, that's the second facet. And in between I have sort of a disordered region, you know, where they sort of try to interpolate between the two things. And then of course in here I will, you know, if I really would analyze this more carefully, I would see the Gaussian fluctuations as promised. 
Okay, so that, that's what I'm going to see on the macroscopic scale. Okay, now what is what is the facet edge in this case? Well, I mean it's easy. It's just the top line, right? I mean, so 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 you know, by definition, by construction, it's of course there, there's there's a mirror image, which sort of the, you know, the, well, anyway. So 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 it's just the top line, and and uh, which borders and the facet zero. Of course, I could make the same construction for the other facet, but let, let's let's concentrate on this one, okay? And so now you can sort of say this in a more clear, sort of more mathematical question. I mean, you know, I have this sort of this line ensemble with the given rules, and, and uh, now I would like to understand the statistics of this top line. All right. Now, uh, now we know one thing. This is prokofsky talapov You see, prokofsky talapov was telling you that there is an, 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 an R to the three half power law, and, and, but now here we're looking at the line density, so, so, so I have to take the derivative, so that it gives you a square root. And so what prokofsky talapov law says you, well, out here, you know, I know, I mean, there I just have density one, and out here I have density zero. I'm plotting simply the line density, and I, I, let's say along, along this line over here, okay? So here it's one, and here it's zero. Now prokofsky talapov tells you that, that you know, it, it, it goes actually with a square root, and then it's sort of well, another square root behavior over here. This is what Prokofsky Talapov say. So it doesn't go as smoothly as you might think. I mean, you know, it sort of starts off with a very sort of infinite slope. Okay, now here comes the exercise for the students, I mean, which uh, uh, I think is actually very, very informative, and you should try to do this. Here's the problem. I mean, take your standard lattice free fermions, the one which you know from your lectures, okay? Just on every lattice size, you might have a fermion, and, 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 and you want to look uh, and, and you want to look at the ground state of this, so with, with the hopping term, and you want to look at the, at the ground state of these free fermions. Now this, of course, you know. I mean, that's just sort of the field Fermi C, so this you know very well. But now what I want to do is I want to put these free fermions in a linear potential. Okay, so if I do the classical thing, I mean, you know it, that's just a parametric formula. But now I want to put at zero temperature the fermions in an external linear potential. That's a very good exercise. The result of this exercise is that, that, that here you will see uh, you know, this sort of like, like, like part of the cosine. I mean, you, you, will, you will see this, this particular formula for the average density, right? OK. Uh, let's assume that we have done this exercise. And uh, now let me uh, explain you a little bit what, what the miracle is. So, so let me first sort of say one, one more word on this. Uh, you see, uh, what we are doing here is, is so, so the domain wall state is, you know, all zero to negative side and, and, and one to the right. And the partition function you can write as psi e to the minus tau h, h is the x c Hamiltonian and psi again. Now, when you look at this object, I mean, you know, this should remind you of a survival property if you do this in real time. So rather than doing it in Euclidean time, you could sort of imagine that, that you replace this here by it. And then, you know, what you will find is sort of you start with the domain wall and you're asking yourself, what is the probability that at time t I will see again the domain wall? So it's just sort of an analytic continuation of, of this quantity. Now, this is something which has been studied recently by, by Jean-Marie Stefan, and, and I'm not going to go into this. I just want to sort of point out that there are some relations to time here. Anyway, so here I want to sort of look at this problem. And now you, 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 you want to study this, and, and uh, let's look at the simplest case. I mean, you know, this is just putting delta equal to zero. Then uh, I have non-interacting fermions, and you would say, ah, you know, but this is something I can solve, right? Now, remember that, that it, 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 it's okay, but, but you see, it, it, it's not, not completely trivial, because uh, now we, we don't have any translation invariance. There's no translation invariant in X. I mean, if you go back to this picture, I mean, you see, I mean, you know, I have, I have, a, I have a macroscopic profile. So there's no translation invariant in X. I mean, there's also no translation invariant in T. I mean, you just look at the picture, right? You know, it's some profile which somehow, you know, it, it decides there must be, at the boundary condition, it must have sort of this, this domain wall, but in the middle it does something. So I have to do free fermions in a somewhat unusual situation. Usually you see free fermions, you say, okay, well, I'll just take Fourier transform and you compute the modes, and then, then you know, I somehow I manage to get the result. But here you cannot do that anymore. And so this is why it's not such, such a simple problem. In fact, it's, 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 it's a difficult problem. I mean, you, if I just sort of, sort of tell you, I mean, you wouldn't know. Anyway, my claim is that, that this, this facet edge is related to the KPC equation. And this is sort of what, what I want to explain you, you next. Um, and this is the miracle which happens, but it happens only at delta equal to zero. So this is at the free fermion point of your XY model. 
Okay? So it's a real miracle. I mean, you know, you, if I just put you, I mean, you wouldn't see it. And, and, but, but, you know, when, once you explain, I think you can sort of understand what the explanation is. I mean, to actually really establish it, you know, requires more than, than I can do during such a lecture. But, but, but I just sort of wanted to give you, a, you know, why, why to the heck should this line have anything to do with the KPC equation? So here comes the connection. Okay, now, now what, 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 what is sort of uh, the somewhat uh, surprising thing? The somewhat surprising thing is that if I'm only interested in the statistics of the top line at some given time t. Well, I mean, you know, what I would have to do is, if I want to do a numerical simulation, I just have to do a Monte Carlo and then produce sort of this equilibrium sort of state and then, then sample and then I get the statistics. However, at delta equal to zero, there is another way of doing it. Namely, rather than sort of doing the Monte Carlo, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm simulating a, a classical particle system which I'm going to explain to you, which is this polar nuclear growth. And that particular model is manufactured in such a way that it exactly reproduces the statistics of the top line. Okay, so I tell you first, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this um, um, uh, the, 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 the corresponding growth model, and, 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 and once, once I have that, I just sort of state that, that the things are the same. So, so, so let me show you what, I mean, this growth model is sort of, quite fun by itself. I mean, so let me, so it's, it's, of course, it's a classical model, right? I mean, so, so it's called polyno polynuclear growth uh, for reasons you, which you will see in a second and, you know, has been invented uh, quite some time ago. And so uh, here we're looking at this. So here is a sort of very simple dynamic. So imagine that, that you have, um, uh, um, so, you, okay, so, you, so you, have, you have a height function. So this height function is, is sort of, uh, in, let's say, over the V line, but, but, but the height differences are, are always uh, plus or minus one. So, you know, if the height goes up, I mean, this is sort of either by plus one or it goes down by minus one. And now I want to tell you how, how such a function is evolving in time. And there, there are basically three rules, if you want. So, uh, yeah, uh, two, two rules, in some sense, okay? So what I'm saying is that if somewhere in this, this height function you see a down kink, which is this one here, then this will move with velocity one. If you see an up kink, then it will be move with velocity minus one. And, uh, you know, now of course it can happen that, that, you know, I have sort of uh, a down and up kink next to each other so that they sort of go onto collision. If they, co if, they, if they coalesce, I mean, then they simply disappear. I mean, so, so they simply annihilate each other. And so you see this one goes over just to uh, something which is completely flat. Now, if I only would do three rules, and if I start with some rough surface, if I wait long enough, of course, you know, eventually it will coalesce and it will just end up with some completely sort of uninteresting flat profile. But now the system is excited, and the system excited is by nucleating, I mean, this is sort of where the growth comes from, nucleating at random space-time points a pair of, of up and down kink. And once I have created it, of course, by, by these dynamical rules, they will just separate. So let's, let me just repeat this, this construction in space-time because then you can sort of another way of looking at it that's sort of quite simple. I mean, so here is space-time. I mean, here's the light cone. Uh, sort of this is the plus and minus one. And, and uh, you have these nucleation events. And, and here, you know, I wanted to produce something which has this curved shape and therefore the nucleation event is only in the forward light cone. So I have this forward light cone and then I make this, this, uh, this uh, red dots. I mean, these are, you know, the space-time points of nucleation. They are completely random. They are just Poisson distributed with, with some uh, uniform density, let's say two or one, and uh, let's say two. And, and uh, so these are these red dots. Now here I have a nucleation event. And so at, at the time you can see, I sort of, you know, it's just sort of there's nothing. And then here I have a first nucleation event. And so I create sort of like, like you know, such, such kind of a height. And then, it, you know, the left and the right edge are moving outwards. And now it might happen that there's another nucleation event over here, but here they coalesce, etc. And then from the picture, I can read off what the height profile is. So here it would be zero. And then, of course, you know, there's the first uh, level line. So it jumps from zero to one. And here then it goes from one to two. And if I want to know what is the height at a given time, I have to take this cross cut and read off what is the height profile, right? I mean, so it's a simple model of... of charges, if you want, so which have plus and minus velocities, which are created in pairs and which are annihilated in pairs. All right. And now, 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 now the claim, a somewhat surprising result, is that uh, if I look at, at the so-created high profile, it will completely agree with the top line in, uh, in the domain wall uh, crystal shape problem, the one which I explained to you before. So now you can argue, 
on the basis of universality and say, look, I mean, it's sort of a growing object, and this is what, what, what the Carter Parisi Sang equation was made for. And so, why, you know, rather than trying to say something about this, this polar nuclear growth model, why not just sort of invoke universality and just try to solve the, the Carter Parisi Sang equation directly? So, this is what, what, what I wanted to show you in this, this slide here. So you see, we, we, want to, we want to get sort of like, like uh, a curved profile. So, so actually what, what we will do is we will get a profile which, which looks like um, x squared over t. So it's like, like a parabola, uh, maybe with a minus sign, actually. Um, uh, and then there will be, will be a little bit shifted. So it's just this function over here. So, so, so there will be some, some, some minus uh, 1 over 24 times t, actually. Okay. So in order to do this, I mean, we, I have to start the KPC equation with a very special initial condition, which is this, this sharp wedge initial condition. So this is sort of a very narrow needle. And this needle sort of immediately spreads into a parabola, which sort of looks like this. Uh, and uh, it's shifted down. But this is, of a, you know, this is typically a non-universal thing, so, so I don't care. I just sort of concentrate my attention to this thing, which sort of has already sort of roughly you know, so this nice rounded shape. But now, of course, because I'm solving a stochastic equation, then, uh, you know, it, actually on top of this, I will see sort of little fluctuations. And if I want to figure out what they are, you know, they are typically of size t to the one third, and they are correlated over times t to the two thirds. That, that's sort of already what, what Carter Parisi Sang already claimed, okay? But now, what's somewhat unexpected, uh, I mean, which we can sort of deduce from the PNG, but in fact, we can also do it directly on the level of the KPC equation. Uh, there are certain quantities which you can compute. And uh, in fact, you can write down an explicit formula for, for the height at the origin. So, so I, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here at x equal to zero. I'm just asking myself, how is this height fluctuating in the course of time? And for this, you can actually write down um, uh, a Fredholm determinant. So it, it's still a somewhat implicit expression. But this Fredholm, it's an infinite dimensional matrix, and it's, you have to compute the determinant of some infinite dimensional matrix, which typically is not such an easy thing. But in this case, I mean, you can sort of do approximation, and eventually, if you want to produce numerics, what I have to do for every data point, I basically have to compute the determinant of something like a 40 by 40 matrix. And what you see is, is the following picture. I mean, so here you see the very early times. So this is sort of like, like a Gaussian peak. I mean, this is sort of, you know, when it just starts spreading, I mean, then it's just the noise, and then the noise sort of is Gaussian, and therefore you see also a Gaussian profile. But then if you wait, I mean, then the nonlinearity will take over, and you will produce this, this t to the one-third scaling, uh, which is already sort of what, 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 what is sort of, you know, when you do the plot, I mean, this is already used. I mean, this is why the initial profile looks so wide. And uh, if I wait sufficiently long, you see that, you know, I do a little bit shoot over, and then uh, eventually I sort of settle down to a curve, which maybe cannot be seen so easily. It's this blue curve here, right? I mean, so, so the green curves are always in between, and, uh, well, anyway, it was just a way how we did the picture, but, but eventually you will settle sort of, you know, at the one which you see here at the very, very end, right? Okay, so this is the limiting distribution, and now you have a per perfectly nice prediction, namely, if, I, if I'm going to look at the statistic of this facet edge, and if I make the facet sufficiently large, and if I do some statistics, then what I'm going to see, if I just look at the, at the facet edge statistics at some given sort of ray, then uh, what you should see in the long time limit, you should see exactly this curve over here. Okay. So that's fine. So we have an exact curve, which maybe you can compare with experiments. Actually, that's not easy. I mean, you know, even to see the prokofsky talapov law is, is something which in Ulich they worked for many, many years. And uh, even now, I would say, you know, they see it, but, you know, it, it's, it's not, you know, with, with the precision you would maybe like. I mean, so it's not so simple. Anyway, there's, yes. Excuse me? Should I go back or? Yeah, so what, what if, if in the. Ah, uh, okay, 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 okay. No, no, you see, I mean, so, so I mean, okay, so maybe, maybe, maybe I do this via a picture, right? I mean, so. Uh, so, so here is here is my here is my PN sheet problem, right? Look, look something like this, man. And I'm sitting at x equal to zero, and then some, some later time I see something like this. No. And so if I'm sitting here, the the the, the dominant term, uh, which of course is not shown in this picture anymore, is simply a linear displacement. Right. And so 
This is a function of time. So what is said is that you know, relative to the linear displacement, which is not shown in the picture, at early times I will be see essentially sort of, you know, at that point, you know, if I look at these fluctuations, uh, I will see essentially uh, uh, a Gaussian distribution. That's this blue curve. And then if I wait longer enough, I mean, then I will see the nonlinearity of the equation, and then the Gaussian distribution will be transformed into something sort of uh, more complicated. And the more complicated in the course of time will actually settle down to something which is universal. Universal in the sense that, you know, if I compute it on the level of the KPC equation, or if I compute it on the level of this discrete Gross model, I will see exactly the same thing. No? I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question or semi, semi answer. Uh, no, 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 but no, 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 no. I mean, you should, you have to put your head like this. I mean, you see the distribution is, is this one here, okay? And so what, you see, I mean, what, what you should ask is where does the asymmetry come from, right? Okay, so, so the asymmetry, yeah, the, the, that, that, that's a very good question, what the asymmetry is coming from. Now, the asymmetry comes from the fact that in this direction, it, it, uh, it, it, it can sort of move fairly freely, but in the other direction, it will see the other lines below, and therefore, it's constrained. Okay, now let's see what we have here. Um, okay, so... Um, Yes, okay, so, so now, now we have this, this nice, nice uh, uh, distribution, and, and, and now it's another surprise in this KPC story, at least for the people who sort of followed this, is that, you know, this was sort of obtained after sort of somewhat, uh, you know, so, you know, I'm not, not telling the precise history, but, uh, but it's certainly correct, it was sort of obtained, you know, through some, some fairly lengthy sort of, uh, um, um, uh, sort of uh, mathematical argument, and at the end, I mean, you, you, you found this particular distribution uh, with a very explicit formula, which, which I have not shown you. Uh, but then people looked at this and said, Ah, oh, you know this distribution. We have seen it already. Now I tell you where we have seen it already, okay? So the way how this, this distribution, so this, this distribution was actually discovered by Tracy and Widem. I mean, and therefore, it's called the tracy widom distribution. And what they were interested in was a sort of a totally different question. Namely, uh, they were looking at, at the so-called GUE ensemble. So this is not GUE. So, uh, so you take an, an N by N matrix, which I call A, and you want to have that this is equal, to, so it's complex Hermitian. Okay. And then now you look at random, which means you take some Gaussian distribution, Trace, and then here you just put, put the A squared or A, A star A. I mean, oh, anyway, so I put the A squared, right? And then you normalize this dA, and you want to look at this random matrix, okay? So now, this is weak now, and then and so if, you, if I look at the density of states, what you find is sort of the famous Wigner semicircle law. So, 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 so these are the energy levels, right? If you want so. And, and if, you, if I put the, the N correctly, I mean, the edge will be at, at 2N. So I have n eigenvalues, they are sitting somewhere over here, and, and I do a normalization in such a way that the, the distance between neighboring eigenvalues would be of order one, and so they are spread over sort of, and then, then this would be two n, okay? Well, now you have, uh, you have, uh, um, uh, you have uh, a largest eigenvalue somewhere. In fact, the largest eigenvalue, this is this asymmetry which I showed you, is a little bit below two n. I mean, so here is maybe the largest eigenvalue, and then of course there are other eigenvalues. And what Tracy and Widem ask is, what is the distribution for large n of the largest eigenvalue? And they worked hard, and they found a particular formula. And what we know is that the same formula which we compute on the basis of the KPC equation has exactly this distribution. So the one which, 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 I, which, which I showed you before, of course, you know, the, the one which is at the very end of this time sequence, uh, can, be, uh, can be obtained directly by, or is, is compared directly to, to the one which you, which you um, get from, from the GUE random matrices. Uh, but of course, it comes out of the Gross process also. Okay, so maybe let me look not at this refinement and, and let me uh, show you also an experiment so that you see that you know, these things are not, not totally disconnected from from sort of experimental investigation. So, so this, is, this is a famous um, experiment by Takeuchi and Sano. Actually, it was, um, I mean, Takeuchi is, is a young person. It was his PhD thesis, I mean, and um, 
he had sort of, uh, uh, he just wanted to do it. And, 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 and what he discovered is, so, so he looked up all this sort of uh, literature about uh, liquid crystals and, you know, he wanted to find a system which has a nice metastable phase, okay? So, in this, you know, there are many substances and, and then, you know, you have phase diagrams, all kind of things. Anyway, so he found one very particular one and it's very beautiful. I mean, so you, you can just see this under the transmission of light. So you have a little probe, I mean, sort of like a centimeter by a centimeter. You put it under a, a, a light microscope and you can see, you know, what is uh, basically on the computer. So you prepare the system in a metastable state. So if you watch, I mean, it doesn't change. The only thing what happens is that once in a while at the end of your, uh, at the border of your probe, I mean, you, you create a nucleus and then sort of, you know, the, uh, the front is advancing, it becomes immediately the stable one. But this is sort of, it doesn't happen too often. I mean, if it happens, I mean, then he would disregard this particular sample, okay? So here you have your probe, nicely prepared in a metastable state. You, you, you shine a laser, so you make a little point in the middle, I mean, sharp laser, and it will create a, a nucleus of the stable phase. And then you see this nucleus growing, and what you see, you know, this is an experimental picture. So what you see on your computer screen is basically this picture. I mean, the one which doesn't transmit light, this is um, the stable phase, and it's still growing outwards into the metastable one. And then you can do the statistics. I mean, you sort of, you know, the, you, this is somewhere at the center, and then you ask what is the vagal statistics, you know, of, of this little sort of uh, rough droplet. And then you can do samples, and you see that he goes, this is on a logarithmic scale. I mean, you, you, you see it goes down to 10 to the minus 4. So he has something like 10 to the 4 samples, and he simply plots these things, okay? And what you find is that you put this logarithmic scale, and then you compare this with Tracy Witham, which is this, this, this uh, dotted line here. This, this is a Tracy Witham distribution, and these things are the, the exp I forgot, forget about the GOE. These are the, the experimental data, and what you see with your naked eye is that it's not really quite the Tracy rhythm, but what's happening is that it's still a little bit shifted because the mean is sort of the slowest uh, degree of freedom which, which sort of uh, you need in order to get the universal distribution. And then, uh, you know, if you could do the experiment a little bit longer, which he has done now, then it would actually be a perfect agreement with, 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 uh, with uh, the prediction of the, of the KPC equation. So it really works, okay? Now there's one thing which sort of, uh, something for the experts, I mean, well, not really experts, sort of, one, one, one uh, point about um, um, uh, a piece of general education, this is what I wanted to say. A piece of general education is that the mean is universal. Everybody who sort of has ever thought about any problem in statistical mechanics with some universal properties should be surprised. The mean is non-universal. And the, the, the experts first couldn't believe that, but it, it's, it's very crucial actually Anyway, so it's not, not important. So, so now, now uh, um, uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, let me uh, sort of wind up a little bit with, with this particular thing. I mean, so I guess I told you already the, the, the main part of the message, but now the last part is sort of, um, what is sort of missing in this story, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, a, a, every story, you know, should, should also have some, some, something sort of, you know, looking into the future. So, now, the first question you could ask, what happens if I vary the delta? You see, the computation was exactly at delta equal to zero. What happens? Now, you're stuck. I mean, you're all these methods, I mean, you have just no idea what to do. All right? So, uh, they are sort of strong guys, and, and at least sort of one thing, what they, what they, uh, what they uh, could obtain, I mean, this is work of Colombo and Bronco. I mean, they, they have actually managed to, to tell you what is, what is, what is the, the, the shape of the facet, of, uh, what, what is the facet boundary? I mean, so, so let, let me maybe go back. I mean, otherwise you will not understand what I'm saying. You see, it's this circle here. So if, if I'm at delta equal to uh, zero, the facet edge happens to be exactly a circle. But if I now turn on the delta, I mean, then, uh, you know, who knows where it goes? But, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Filippo and, and, um, and um, Bronco, I mean, they, they have a formula for the facet edge. Okay, so you know a little bit. Now you ask themselves, can they actually show, once they have the facet edge, maybe they can show Bukowski talapov that's, that's the R to the three half. Uh, we don't know. I mean, we just don't know. 
uh, can they show uh, KPC? We don't know. So at the moment, I mean, since, since you know, I was in, in, in Florence and then, then they challenged me and said, I mean, you know, do you really believe that? You know, I, I believe immediately that, that if I put delta different from zero, well, you know, I mean, of course it must have to be the same, right? I mean, it would be very surprising from a statistical point of, mechanics point of view, if, if you know, suddenly, you know, changes dramatically. I mean, you know, there's a little bit of repulsion or attraction. Of, of course, it will not change the universal properties. So uh, they said, well, you know, but how do you know? Okay, well, I don't know, but, uh, but then uh, now, uh, you know, we found this is actually an interesting challenge, and, and we are doing at the moment uh, Monte Carlo simulations uh, at delta equal one half. This is so-called alternating sign matrix point, which uh, has particular sort of, from a numerical point of view, nice properties. And um, uh, uh, it's essentially finished, but I don't want to show you any picture, but I mean, it is confirmed. I mean, you know, what, what we see in our numerical simulations, uh, they are a little bit demanding for various reasons, but in any case, because it's a critical system and therefore it's not so easy to do, but we do see the KPC behavior. So that sort of looks okay. Another thing which you can look at is, is, is delta larger than one. I mean, that's sort of where they sort of really want to sit next to each other. And then suddenly this whole, uh, this whole nice facet disappears completely uh, and, and you see it's just sort of a sharp edge, right? I mean, so it's like, it, it's like having um, uh, two faces of a ferromagnet and they are simply touching each other. So one is of the plus face, the other one is the minus face. And uh, this is related to the fact that the XXC chain has a spectral gap, exactly, which vanishes exactly at delta equal one. So, so as I go from, from larger delta towards delta equal one, this interface will of course have fluctuations of order one, but you know, they start to become larger and larger. And so it's another critical phenomena which you can analyze, I mean, using this sort of KPC techno technology. And in fact, at criticality, you find the square root of T log T fluctuations or trough fluctuations and, uh, and, and they are actually non-Gaussian. I mean, so that's something which you can do. But there's another thing which is missing. There's another thing which is missing in this picture. Namely, you see, why to the heck should I have the domain wall on the other side exactly at the origin? You see, I mean, I might just simply shift, right? I mean, so, so, so why don't I do the following? Here's the origin, and now I fill it up, so here they are. And now I put the other point uh, over here, and then I'm filling up, right? So, so now the step is at this point, and, and of course, you know, if this is tall, I mean, to have something macroscopic, I mean, I would, would make this distance also tall, right? What happens then? Well, you know, if you think in terms of surfaces, I mean, that's the most natural thing to do because, you know, after all, I have a surface in 2D and it has two slopes. I mean, it has, you know, the two, two, I mean, the gradient is a two vector, right? I mean, it can slope either this way or it can slope the other one. And of course, uh, you know, if I look at the profile in between, even if I put the boundary condition over here somewhere else, I, I will see sort of a non-trivial slope. But now I can just enforce such a slope by, by shifting this, okay? We don't know how to do that. I mean, there's simply no result, but it's, it's a very natural question. Uh, let me, uh, okay, so, so now, now, now let's, let's uh, so, so, so let's, okay, I, I sort of, went a little bit too quickly. I mean, before doing this, uh, you, maybe you just want to keep that, that, that uh, symmetry and you want to go to delta less, less than minus one. Okay, now there's another interesting phenomenon which appears that as you, if you, as you are delta less than one, uh, you see, I mean, you, you have this, this outer edge here. I mean, so this is, of course, what, what uh, Colombo and Bronco computed. But now, you see, I mean, these, these things, I mean, want to really repel. I mean, you know, they, they, they just don't like to sit next to each other. I mean, how does the system respond to this? Well, I mean, the answer is that uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, it, in, in the middle, it, it generates another little facet over here, which somehow, you know, takes up all that tension. And so if you look in this facet, so it's, again, it's, it's essentially flat, but uh, has little sort of statistical errors. Actually, it's, it's not, not like up here where you have perfect facets. It's really sort of, sort of a little bit, uh, you know, you, there, are, there are fluctuations. Uh, and here you see the antiferromagnetic status. So you, here you see alternating empty occupied, empty by occupied. So, so th this is how the system sort of reacts to, to sort of, you know, enforcing a very, very strong repulsion. It doesn't break up the whole thing. No, no, out, out there, you know, I mean, you, you, you have, you know, the, the boundary condition which forces you to make the perfect passage. But, but then, you know, the only place where you can still do something is in the middle of the bounded piece, and there you create another facet. Okay. 
Now, uh, can we compute, uh, the, for instance, the shape of that facet? Well, okay, so, so there is work. I mean, I don't want to go into detail. I just want to sort of emphasize that, that you know, while you might think I'm telling you something which sort of has been completed, you know, I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, there are lots of very natural open questions. So, uh, so what, 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 what about this slope? Well, you see, I mean, I can impose the slope by, by, by you know, for instance, shifting at this, but, but then you might ask, well, maybe, you know, it's sort of like equivalence of ensembles. Maybe I can encode the slope directly into our, my quantum Hamiltonian. What does the slope mean? Well, the slope means that, you know, you, you basically enforce that, that these lines, rather than sort of making symmetric random walks, I mean, you know, they have to go up. I mean, so they have, will have some average drift. I mean, that's sort of what I'm enforcing. Can I put this directly into my quantum Hamiltonian? Yes, of course I can. Well, what do I have to do? Well, here I've written down again this, this quantum Hamiltonian. Here I have the hopping term, and, and, and of course you're very much used to the fact that you want to make it symmetric. I mean, this is what you're told by your teachers, right? It's a symmetric Hamiltonian, so therefore you have a symmetric hopping. Okay? But now in this statistical mechanics problem, you know, if I want to sort of impose uh, uh, a net drift, I mean, I should rather make an asymmetric hopping. So I put here an e to the theta and here an e to the minus theta. Why I do this in this particular way? That's a different story, but, but the, the main point, what you should see is that, you know, I mean, the, the, the right left and the left right hops sort of have a different weight. Okay? And this is something which is called the asymmetric HXXC model. And uh, I have thrown out quantum mechanics out of the door. Why? Because it's no longer a symmetric operator, right? You know, I mean, if I take the edge joint of this one, uh, I will get this one, but, but with, with the wrong coefficient. Non-symmetric. This is why it's called asymmetric. Now you think a little bit about what you learned in quantum mechanics. I mean, you know, you have you have uh, an XXY chain. I mean, you can think of putting this on a ring, and then you put a magnetic flux line through, and then you know that you will get sort of something like this. However, this will be self-adjoint. So if I now make an analytic continuation in theta, then I put an e to the i theta, and here an e to the minus i theta, then I'm back in business. That's a self-assigned operator and corresponds physically to putting this flux line through your ring. So if you, if you want to, I mean, you could study the magnetic problem and then do the analytic continuation, which of course would be a completely crazy idea. I mean, this will never work, right? I mean, but I just want to say that, that you know, the, 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 I mean, the, this connection between uh, you know, uh, 1D quantum systems and, 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 and 2D statistical mechanics is sort of somewhat more richer than, than sort of what I sort of indicated at the beginning. Okay, so I think this sort of brings me back to uh, the conclusions. Let me see. Yeah, okay, so this is a summary of, of, uh, of the first connection. And um, uh, the idea was, you know, we make a short break and then, then I continue with something sort of, I mean, not orthogonal, but somewhat separate. And um, uh, I just want to emphasize again, I mean, what I was doing here is I was using the connection between statistical mechanics of 2D line ensembles and, uh, and as generated by a quantum spin chain. And uh, the object which we looked at was something very, very, very specific, namely a facet in the statistical mechanics model and the fluctuations of the facet edge. And the conclusion was that the statistics of the facet, facet edge are governed by an equation which was written down for completely different purposes, but which happens to model also these very particular fluctuations. So if there are questions, thank you very much. Yes? What? X, X, yes, yes, X, X, E, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, I, I don't know offhand. I would have to. Uh, okay. I, I, I think I cannot really immediately answer, but I would have to do a little bit of thinking. And uh, but, but you know, if you catch me, I mean, maybe, maybe I can answer. So I, I mean, I guess we mostly investigated that that very particular connection. But it could very well be that you know, if you sort of look at a somewhat somewhat uh, more general model, I mean. But you see, you would have, I mean, so, so, so you, you always, I mean, in order to get the, the connection, you somehow have to uh, connect it 
to, to some sort of facet edge, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's, I mean, you know, th 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 there's no connection if you look at any sort of bulk property or so. I mean, this just sort of doesn't make any sense. I mean, the, the, the whole point of, of this lecture is that, that if you somehow, you know, in this model or sort of its statistical mechanics version, if you sort of create something which has a facet edge, I mean, then, then you're in business, right? So you first have to create a facet edge, I mean, yes. Yeah. That's correct, yes. Uh, well, can you? I mean, can you get rid of the, of the magnetic field? I mean, well, it's sort of magnetic flux. I mean, you know, things will be, will be you know, there will be a current which is induced in the, in the XXC. Uh, so I, I don't think, no, I don't think you can get it away. You see, it's, it has periodic boundary condition. I mean, so so it, it, it depends on the boundary condition. If you if you make if you make other boundary conditions, uh, you, you might, but but in this particular case, I don't think you can get it away. Uh, well, okay. So let's let's make a little break and um, continue then.
also have to sort of uh, to condense back. reasons because now people that study dynamics in what uh, what are called random circuit models oh, that's correct I know yes uh, yeah, no, that, that's another info but, but I, I'm, I'm not so much uh, I mean th this is something which which you know I haven't really worked myself so so you know I would not be able to so the reason yeah, no, that's but you was I, mentioned in the school before ah, okay yeah, so no, no, in the sense right. they have yeah, additional yeah. connections yeah, yeah. And no but they are they are the, the point is that you know this entanglement entropy is sort of I mean that, that's the main point I mean that that they Establish that the entanglement entropy sort of satisfies sort of like both type dynamics. That's right? correct, yeah. That's and, and, then, and then, then uh, I mean, well, but once you're at that stage, I mean, sort of more or less obvious that should be capable. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So good, 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 good. Walkers, they need at least three. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. No, they're both okay. still coming. You can start the second part of All right. Herbert's lectures. Okay, so, so this now is, uh, as I said already, I mean, this will be a totally different talk. So, um, in case, I mean, you know, the first part was slightly uh, hard to understand. I mean, this is totally orthogonal. Of course, you know, what, what is kept is the connection to the KPC, but, but otherwise it, it's sort of talking about very different kind of physics. Okay, so, so here I'm now really starting with, with quantum spin chains and, um, and um, sort of from a statistical mechanics point of view, I mean, there's a sort of very particular uh, way of, of probing the dynamics and, and uh, these are sort of, you know, time properties very close to global thermal equilibrium and, and the usual terminology for these objects are equilibrium time correlations. In our case, let's say for quantum spin chains, okay? So let me, of course, you know, some of you know, but, but just sort of for the sake of being on the same level, let me sort of just sort of talk a little bit about equilibrium time correlations in general and then, then come to the more specific kind of things which, which, which uh, I would like to explain. Okay, so I'm going to look at the, at the generic spin chain, which is translation invariant. There's no disorder. I mean, I'm not looking at many body localization or anything of that. I mean, so it, it's um, just sort of one of the standard spin chains. And, and the crucial point of the spin chain is that when you look at the, at the energy, uh, you know, there is, there is an energy density, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, which is here, the, 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 the little h sub j. And of course, the h is simply the, 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 the full uh, Hamiltonian is simply the sum over, over the local density. And uh, of course, the, the main also important point is, uh, yeah, it depends on the model, but what I want to do here is this, this, this density is actually local. Maybe it could be quasi-local, but I mean, let, let's say it's local. So, so, so let, let, let's just look at that. At the XXZ chain to have an example. So, so I first, you know, look at the operator H at lattice side zero, which is then simply the, this nearest neighbor coupling. So the sigma C sigma one, and uh, and uh, the CC component. So that that's a Hamiltonian which I've written down before. And if you are now want to write the full Hamiltonian, then I should take this operator and simply shift it. I mean, if I want to have this density, I simply shift this by j. I mean, this is what is meant by h j. It's the same operator. I mean, h at zero, h of j is the same operator, just shifted by j lattice size. And uh, then, then, you know, if you shift it, I mean, then this index becomes j and this j plus one. And if you dumb sum, then you see the same operator as totally before. Okay, so this, these are the kind of things which you want to know. And then, of course, there's a thermal equilibrium state, which is given by e to the minus beta h. And the average is usually denoted by beta. And I'm sort of imagining that the system is very large. So since we are in one dimension, you know, the, you can sort of uh, easily think about infinite dimension. I mean, that's sort of not very important. So now I want to look at some local observables. So again, I mean, local just means that, that you know, it, it depends on, on a few, few uh, lattices sort of uh, close to the point of reference. Let's say here's zero. And I have the translates H A. They are the same operator shifted by J. And now I want to look at their time correlation. So this is sort of the usual definition. I mean, so, so it's, 
you might take the Kubo product, but, but let, let, let me not make things unnecessarily complicated. So, so here I look at this operator at lattice side uh, j, uh, shifted to lattice side j time t, and the same one at zero. And uh, I take thermal average. That's what's called equilibrium. It's time because I do the time displaced correlation. And then I put the C because I subtract the spatial average, and so that's C stands for connected. Okay? Now, I just remind you that there's a Leap Robinson bond which tells you that, you know, if I think, so, so now I have just, I mean, once I fix all these things, I just have a function of J and T. And the Leap Robinson bond tells you that if I fix time T, and if I make J large, then eventually, you know, this, this object will become actually sort of uncorrelated. But the way how it becomes uncorrelated is that uh, it's sort of linearly in time. So there's here sort of this light cone, which is bounded by the Leap Robinson velocity. And if I'm outside that light cone, I mean, so, so you know, of course that velocity is model dependent. If I'm outside, then sort of these correlations are essentially zero. Okay, so that's a very very generic structure. Okay, now um, there's another way of of looking at these things, uh, perfectly equivalent. I mean, you know, I can sort of put put this operator A sort of into my initial state. I mean, maybe I want to make it a real density matrix. So I put here a to one half, and here also a to the one half. And then I can think of the same, physically the same thing is, is I have my system prepared in equilibrium. I perturb somewhere close to the origin. I'm asking myself, how is this, this, uh, this um, uh, perturbation moving in time? And what Lee Robinson tells you is that, you know, it can sort of grow at, at most linearly. I mean, it's just sort of maybe less, but, but certainly at most linearly. All right. Now, of course, you know, there's still a lot of arbitrariness in terms of of what kind of, what kind of uh, operator I should do. And, and so for the purpose of this talk, I want to sort of restrict myself to operators which come from local conservation laws. So this means that if I'm thinking of the energy, then the energy is the sum of, of uh, sort of has a density, so these are the HAs. And then I would look at, at the energy, energy, the local energy, energy correlation, time displaced, right? I mean, this is sort of what I want to do. Of course, you can do other things. I'm presumably doing this sort of uh, uh, summer school, I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, you certainly must have seen this out of time ordered correlation, which are sort of commutator squared and then expectations. So, so of course, there are lots of other things which you could do, but for my purpose, I mean, I want, just want to do the standard time displaced thing, okay? Now, uh, if, I want to do, if I want to have some sort of theoretical understanding of these things, I mean, uh, it, it, it's actually a useful idea to first make a list of, 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 of all the conserved quantities. I mean, so, so, so I call them Q here. You, you, you very often they call your charges. Okay, so think of them as charges here. And then Q is sort of the extensive quantity, which has a label N. And then, of course, you know, it's assumed that they have sort of local, uh, you know, local densities. And so I can sum them uh, just, just as for the, for the XY for the energy. I mean, I can sum them like this, okay? And uh, the, once they are local, and then uh, if I look at the time change of, 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 of the local objects, which is this one, it must satisfy uh, a conservation law. I mean, that's just sort of the fact that, that the global quantity commutes with the Hamiltonian. So, so, that, so this thing can be sort of written as a difference, just telling you how much is coming into the side J and it's moving out of the side J. And of course, if I'm doing the sum over all J, then here I have a telescoping sum in which is equal to zero. Right? I mean, so, so this is sort of well known, but I just sort of wanted to remind you. Um, of course, the H will be part of the list. I mean, so depending on what model you're looking, H has label two or, or labeled four, anyway. I mean, so H is, of course, part of the list. And I just want to point out that in general, there's no reason why these controlled shafts should commute amongst themselves. I mean, typically you will have, you know, uh, it depends. I mean, just there's no reason. And, and of course, there are models where say, they simply don't compute. I mean, if you think of an Heisenberg model and if you think of the three spin components, I mean, they certainly will not commute, right? Okay, so this is sort of general. And, uh, and now what I want to do is I, I have sort of two cases. I mean, so one case is, you know, where this list of conservation laws sort of never stops. I mean, basically you have the number of course conservation law is proportional to the size of the system, and therefore this list will go on forever. Then you have uh, sort of the very exceptional case of, uh, of, of an integrable quantum chain, 
uh, which I do not want to discuss. I mean, we, we just had, you know, sort of a four days conference at CISA and then lots of talk about integrable quantum chains, but I mean, here I don't want to discuss them. And it's easy to break. I mean, if you have a quantum, for instance, you, you take an XXC model would be integral, but if you might want to make it non-integrable, you put either higher spin or, or, or maybe you put the next nearest neighbor coupling, it will become immediately non-integrable. So I just want to look at the non-integrable case. And now comes sort of uh, a real riddle, I mean, which, which uh, you know, uh, I, to me it's sort of, uh, sort of a basic question, but, but uh, because it's such an obvious question and, and it's so obviously difficult that, that, you know, one doesn't know what to do. So, ex you know, empirically, you know, you, you, you study all kind of various sort of um, uh, one-dimensional quantum spin chains, but you discover that the number of conserved quantities sort of it goes maybe, you know, spin and energy or something like this, it goes to one, two, three, four, and then it stops. So you will never, you know, you will never find a natural, of course you can sort of somehow artificially construct, but if I take a truly interacting model, you will never find anything which, which has 57 conservation laws. So either it's very few or it's infinity. I mean, why? I mean, so maybe, uh, anyway, so there's this, this, this uh, dichotomy, I mean, uh, that, that uh, you know, either you have a four f small and it's not integrable or it's immediately integrable. Anyway, so I'm assuming that the N0 is, 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 is fixed and small and, and typically you should think of, of two or three maybe or four, I mean, it's just sort of a small, okay? So once, once you have this, then of course you have to, if you have several conservation laws, you have to sort of expand a little bit your equilibrium states because you know, then there will be chemical potentials, and so you will get an equilibrium state which sort of has this particular structure, right? All right. Okay, so, so let, let me repeat the question. So I, I'm, I'm fixing the parameter of my equilibrium state, so this means I'm fixing the chemical potentials. In this, in this uh, uh, equilibrium state, I want to look at time-displaced correlations uh, so since it's a correlator and I have n naught uh, uh, conserved quantities, this will be in an n naught by n naught matrix as a function of space-time, and I just want to know how it depends on space and time. That's it. Okay? That's a rather, rather simple and straightforward question. Um, and, um, but uh, <laughs> maybe it's not so totally easy to answer, and so in order to build up some, some intuition and to make connection with the KPC equation, let me go back to a case which is sort of much easier and much better understood, namely to a classical chain. And so, so for, for a little while, I will just talk about the classical chain, uh, which you uh, have seen, and then anyway, so, so it will be quite obvious, okay? So here's my classical chain. I mean, so, so, so this is called an anharmonic chain. I mean, so, so now, now I have my, my label, and at every label point, I have a position and momentum. Uh, so I'm really thinking sort of as a lattice field theory. And then there's an energy, which of course is the kinetic energy, and then there's an interaction energy, which I assume to be uh, of difference of the positions. I mean, this is some, some nonlinear potential, right? And so there are famous example. I mean, the FPU chain is of this form. I mean, then, uh, then uh, you know, you have a, a quartic uh, polynomial uh, as your interaction. I mean, you can take hard core, which sort of... Uh, uh, you know, a silver outside the diameter A and then infinity otherwise. Uh, now, now, this model, of course, is integrable because, you know, in, in a one-dimensional collision, I mean, you, you know, it's just it's sort of like, like particles. If you are relabeled, particles are just going through each other. So if I want to make this model non-integrable, I have to break, uh, oops, I have to break uh, the integrability. And the way how this is usually done is, is that you just put alternating masses. So have mass one, mass three, mass one, mass three, and this immediately breaks integrability, right? I mean, so, so this is another standard model. I mean, the total lattice is, is integrable. Anyway, so, so this is what I can do. Now I want to follow my, my, my prescription. First, list the conserved quantities. I'm always simply assuming that, that uh, it, it's, uh, it's not integrable. Okay, well, so, so the first uh, conserved quantity is actually the stretch, which is sort of uh, the volume between neighboring particles. So, so it's just a positional difference. I mean, then momentum is a conserved quantity and the local energy. So the local energy, because it's written like this, you see, is also written in terms of uh, the stretch. And so you can think of your evolution equation actually in terms of the stretches of the momentum and the uh, and end of the momentum. I mean, it's so slightly unfamiliar, but, but, but it's a convenient way to look at it. Well, so, so let's first do the equilibrium. Well, I take e to the minus beta h. You see, it's sort of essentially a product here. I, I put already the RJ, and so if I just rewrite this thing in the exponential, 
then you see that, that I have the kinetic energy, which might be displaced. So, so I have a mean velocity. So that's the displacing this object. Then, of course, it's the V of Rj. But then, uh, you see, you also have to fix this, the stretches, which usually you do sort of my canonical by pinning the chain sort of at either end. But if I go to the, to the canonical picture, then you see that this induces uh, simply a linear extra potential. And uh, if you look at the formula carefully, you see that this is nothing else but the, the pressure or the tension inside the chain, right? So I just, the main part of, of this little formula is that, that, you know, as promised, I mean, I have three conserved quantities, I have three parameters. Later on, I will put u equal to zero because I can get rid of it by, by Galilean invariance. And you see that the equilibrium measure is particularly simple. It's just a product. So equilibrium is, is totally trivial, right? I mean, all right, so, so this I can do. And, and now, now I can look at just the quantity which, which I discussed, but within the, this classical context, namely, um, I have this evolution equation, so I just promise you to, you know, here, there, there are no cues appearing anymore, so it looks like this. So you see here that there's the coupling of lattice side J to the, to the right neighbor. Here's the coupling of the lattice side J to the left neighbor, but it it's more, looks more asymmetric than what you are used to from a quantum swing chain. That's simply me because I have sort of, you know, plucked the position and, and, and the momentum at the side in, in, into one, one vector. And, and of course, they have very different properties. Okay? And now I can look at, at this time correlation. So, so, so this is just an abbreviation for these three conserved quantities. I mean, so it's R, P, and E as a function of J and T, as a function of J and T. And so here is this label. And so as promised, I mean, you know, this equilibrium time correlator is a three by three matrix, right? It's alpha and alpha prime that labels for you the conserved quantity, and then it's a function of space and time. So now, what are you going to see? Well, what you are going to see is always the following picture. You know, so always means that, that uh, uh, okay, always means that you're, you're going to see three peaks all the time. Now, now, now the area under these peaks depends on, so, you know, what particular initial condition I, uh, what, what particular linear combination I take here. I mean, sort of, you know, which particular, I mean, think of this as a matrix, and then, uh, you know, I'm just, just looking at particular matrix elements, and it, it depends uh, on, on, on which matrix elements I'm taking. But what I'm saying is that even, you know, allow sort of arbitrary, you know, sort of, I mean, multiply to the left and to the right with some vectors, I mean, then you get a scalar quantity, and then you will always see this thing, except for the fact that, you know, it's self-similar, so, so maybe the area under this peak happens to be sort of very small or even zero, and you only see the right moving peak, but you will always see the same things, right? And so you will have three peaks. I mean, one of them is sort of uh, sitting, moving with the velocity of sound, and then there's another peak, which is called the heat peak, uh, which is sitting in the middle, and uh, which is sort of, uh, you know, uh, well, has, has a particular shape. Okay, so I should, here at the moment the emphasis is that that you know while you're at first sight you might think that you know you, you see something very complicated, the structure is in fact you know uh, sort of at least in first approximation very simple three peaks, and these peaks are broadening in time. Right? Of course they are broadening in time. I mean they're not not uh, you know they, they don't stay like this. And so here in order to convince you, I, I, I sort of uh, brought along a, a numerical computation. So what has been done in this system is it's a simulation of um, um, of the fermi passa ulam chain. And what you should see is, is that, I mean, the, the, the color code are three different times. I mean, here's the early time. So here you see the central peak, and here you see the, the two sound peaks. Now, you see, it look, looks very funny, the peak. It looks very unphysical. Of course, it, 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 it looks unphysical because, uh, you know, we have normalized the area under each one of these peaks equal to one, which, uh, of course, in, in actual fact, I mean, they are normalized by particular susceptibilities, and therefore it would look different. But, but I mean, just in order to see the principle, I mean, it's useful to so normalize them to one. And so you see that, that uh, in the course of time, so this is 800, this is 1300, 2007. I mean, you know, this book is moving over here, this over, over here, you just hardly can see the green peak, but uh, you know, it's sort of out here is the green peak. And uh, of course, you know, this, this motion is linear, but then they are broadening with a particular exponent. And you see also this, this peak in the middle. And uh, one thing which, which I wanted to point out is that the middle peak sort of seems to behave somewhat differently than the other ones. You see the middle peak, this one has sort of rather long tails and, you know, sort of reaches almost into sort of the noisy region. And, and then there's a deeper reason for that. So, so there is fine structure in terms of, you know, the way how they broaden. But I want to emphasize that the, the basic structure is three very well-defined peaks. So, so they, they broaden sublinearly, right? I mean, they, they separate linearly in time, but 
but their width is actually sublinear. Yes, question. Sorry, I'm, I'm in the same difficulty as Uli. I, if if, uh, if uh, for that distance and with the poor acoustics, I cannot hear. Ah, okay, that's a good question here. So this, no, it's not independent of alpha and beta. But, but the point is that the three peaks, of course, you know, they are always there. I mean, whatever I do with alpha and beta, so alpha and beta are the coefficients in front of the, the question was how much does it depend on the particular potential I'm using. So alpha and beta are the coefficients in front of the x to the power of four and, 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 and x cubed, right? What was that? Excuse me? It's three by three matrix, yes? Does it matter which, which... Oh, you're talking about, sorry, okay, so I missed the question. Okay, so now, 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 now. the question was, does it happen? Okay, so, so let, let, let me write this down maybe more, more clearly. I mean, so, so, so I want to have a, a scalar quantity. I mean, so let's say I write S alpha prime of J and T, and then, then I have some, some, some vector psi of alpha prime, and psi of alpha, over alpha and alpha prime, okay? And now, now I can ask myself, as I change this vector, I mean, does it change, right? And there is, yes, it changes, but the only way how it changes is that it changes self-similar in the sense that the area under the curve, of course, depends on which way I twist the alpha. So I can twist the alpha in such a way that I see no left moving peak. Or I can twist it in such a way that I now see no central peak. But the point is that, that it will be always a linear operation. So, so whatever I, I do, I will always see sort of qualitatively this picture, except for the weights of the, of the various contributions. Okay. Well, that's going to come, yes. Mm -hmm. OK, so, so this is, this is what, what, what you see. And now, OK, since you asked already uh, what is the broadening, um, I mean, there's a lot of things, and, and uh, you know, three years ago, uh, I, I actually lectured exactly in the same room, and I had six hours, and I explained all the details of this beautiful picture. But today, I'm just interested in one, one fact, namely, uh, when, you, when you look at, at the broadening of, of this peak, of the sound peak, then the claim is that it will be KPC-like. Okay, so, so the, the, the broadening of the sound peak generically will be as you would compute from the KPC equation. So it's this, I guess, uh, I'm going to explain in the next slide. Yes, okay, so, so now I want to explain the, the connection to the stationary KPC equation. Okay, so let's, let, let's have a look. I mean, so, so here I've written down for you again this, this equation, and, and you see, I mean, this is an equation which sort of this describes this growing surface, and therefore it's non-stationary. I mean, you know, it's sort of, you know, this, this surface keeps growing and growing. I mean, it doesn't settle to anything. So you might wonder, how can I do stationary? Well, it's a simple trick, which you know very well. I mean, think, think of a random walk. I mean, it's non-stationary, because, you know, as I go, I mean, you know, the mean square displacement will grow indefinitely. So what is stationary in a random walk? I talk about, can I talk about a stationary random walk? Yes, of course I can. What is stationary are the increments. You see, that, you know, the, 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 the steps which I'm doing, they can have a stationary statistics. So rather than looking at the walk, if I look at its gradient, its time derivative, this will be stationary, right? So it's the velocity which is stationary. <clears throat> and, and the same thing over here. If I take a spatial gradient, so if I take height differences, then this will be stationary. Now taking gradients is easy, you see, so here I take this derivative. And so, you know, you just sort of go through everything. I mean, so I have u, which is the derivative, and now I have everywhere a derivative, so I can pull it out. And now I get a nice sort of, again, very generic equation. You see, it has the form of a conservation law, which I would like to have. It's CDQ, it's DTX of some carbon. Now, this carbon has a linear piece, which is sort of, you know, the one which we would naturally down. I mean, there's sort of intrinsic noise from the system. I mean, you know, then there's some, you know, fluctuation dissipation theorem, which tells you that, that uh, you know, once, once, once I have a dissipation, this is the friction term, then, uh, you know, I should have noise. So, so this is sort of very well known. And, and then, then, you know, there's a sort of a nonlinear piece of the carbon. So it's just saying that in general, you know, there's no reason to expect that, that the carbon should be a linear function. And therefore, I put in this lowest nonlinearity. And again, you know, the claim I emphasized this before is that if I simply drop the nonlinearity, then I will get Gaussian behavior, which is sort of qualitatively wrong. I mean, in order to explain the phenomena, I really have to keep the nonlinearity. 
Anyway, so you look at this equation, and then, then you have to do a little bit of exercise, and you find, you find that the, this equation indeed has a stationary solution. And the stationary solution is that, that, uh, uh, that the u, you know, so this is now uh, something which doesn't change in time, but I have to tell you what the statistics is. And the statistics is, is simply that this function u of x is actually wide in space, or so it's, it's Gaussian and has this particular correlation. That's really a stationary solution of this equation. Well, now I know the stationary solution, so now I can write down my, my time correlation. That's the u of x and t u u zero. And for this, from the KPC equation, I mean, you know, this is sort of somewhat difficult proof, but I mean, this is an, actually a theorem for f not only for the KPC, but uh, I mean, this was the one which came latest, but before we had for other models, but in any case, I mean, it's a difficult theorem and, and, and sort of rather intricate, but anyway, what the assertion is that there's a normalization in front, which is just the integral over dx. The integral over dx is conserved because it comes from a conservation law, and this is just a static susceptibility, so I call it new. I mean, so, so, so you know, the, the, the integral over this function is normalized to one. I mean, this is why I need this factor, uh, let's see, this, this, should be maybe, this should be maybe a minus here, right? I mean, so, 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 so then, then when I do the integral in dx, it's equal to one. Yeah, that, that's a minus sign. I just missed this. Okay. And the, the, the crucial point is that we now, you know, so this tells you that these sound peaks are broadening with t to the two-third. That was your question. But we also know what is the exact scaling function. The scaling function is, you know, a quantity which I compute on the basis of this stochastic Burgos equation. And it's a particular function here. I missed, uh, ah, so maybe I was lazy when I wrote this transparency. I mean, so, so I missed here the index KPC. I mean, so it's that function. And I, I'm not going to show very much of it. I mean, you know, it, it's normalized to one. It's positive. It's an even function. And it has tails which go like, like x cubed. Again, you know, it's given essentially in terms of some, some infinite dimensional determinant which, which, uh, which I'm not, not going to write on. So my main point at that stage is that uh, on the classical level, we know very well and we have, you know, numerically and, and to some extent theoretically well-established evidence that when I look at these moving sound peaks that they have a very specific scaling form. They broaden like t to the two-third and, and, and their shape is uh, an explicitly computed scaling function. Asymptotic shape, I mean, you know, the shape which you see is not, not uh, maybe I should say this here. You see, uh, I mean, look, look, try to look at the green line. You know, it, it, it's still not, not actually completely perfect. I mean, because, you know, it should be a symmetric function, but it is not really yet a symmetric function. So here we are still a little bit away from, from, from the scaling regime. But if you would lay, you know, uh, another, I mean, we have simulations for even longer times, I mean, then you can see that it becomes more symmetric. Okay, now, now here's a short word of, of uh, how this works. I mean, maybe, maybe I make this, 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 this really very short, namely, uh, uh, it's sort of based on, on, on some nonlinear version of fluctuating hydrodynamics. And, and, you know, this stochastic Burgos equation is sort of one particular case. And, and uh, somehow the argument is that if you wait long enough, these peaks decouple and, 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 and the sound peak by itself can be written in terms of this Burgos equation. But basically, forget my explanation. I mean, it's too short anyhow, and it, it's not, not so important for what, 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 what I'm trying to say. What is more important is that uh, uh, these this, uh, time correlations obviously have a ballistic component. I mean, they are moving outwards. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure whether, whether I'm sort of making connections sort of very well here to the quantum systems, but, but maybe to some of you, uh, you know, usually uh, the presence of ballistic component is detected by the so-called Rude weight. I mean, so let me just introduce this terminology because uh, it's very widely used in the quantum community, and, and so I might just explain it into, into this context. So, so the way how you, um, um, I mean, one way to define the Trude weight is the following. I mean, so I'm looking now, you see here I looked at the conserved quantities, now I look at the carbon-carbon correlation. So this is the carbon across the origin at time zero, initial time, and this is the carbon across the lattice, at the lattice side j at time t. And I can look at this carbon, and I want to look at the total carbon, so I'm actually summing over all j. I mean, this is a well-defined sum because of Lee Robinson, this actually decays exponentially in j, and so I can do the sum once I truncate in x. Okay, so I have, this is the total carbon-carbon correlation as a function of time. Now, ballistic transport uh, is reflected by this function not decaying to zero. 
Okay, so if I look at the long time limit of this function and I discover that it's non zero, then it means that I must have some ballistic component which is moving out. Now, which ballistic component one doesn't know? It's a sum rule, I mean, so it doesn't tell you much of a detail, but it tells you that there must be some ballistic component. Okay, so, so, so I just want to say that, that uh, you know, I mean, one, one conclusion of all these discussions is that the true weight is definitely non zero and just comes from, from the two sound peaks, right? So I can compute the true weight explicitly, but it, it, it's, it's not, 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 not very important. I just want to emphasize that. Uh, you know, there's sort of a probe uh, which is very useful and which, which in the quantum community is sort of mostly used. All right. Okay, so now, now I want to come to the, to the, to the quantum chains and um, I just want to ask the same question, right? I may take a quantum chain, I have some conserved quantities and I want to compute uh, uh, the, the time uh, Correlations, and now I discover something which, which uh, you know, I, I'm still puzzled. I asked many people, including Uli and, and many other, but but uh, you know, the net result is that we simply don't know. So uh, I want to have the model non-integrable. See, I want to have these moving sound peaks, so I want to have a non-zero through the weight. And it seems to be that as soon as I impose Non-integrability, the true the weight is always zero. Maybe, maybe we are just not clever enough to find a model, or maybe, maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's some basic fact about quantum spin chain. So, so, so it, it seems that you know, when I write down a quantum spin chain, I never have any ballistic component. That's, of course, not very good news, because then I'm not going to see the KPC behavior, right? But let's, let's dwell a little bit on this. So when, once, you, once the true weight is, is non-zero, then the, the most natural thing to say is, well, you know, all these uh, complicated nonlinearities, I mean, you can, can just forget. I mean, I just look at the linear equation, and the linear equation predicts for you a simply a Gaussian peak, which is broadening like square root of t, just which, what you would like from the fundamental solution of the heat equation. And so maybe that's what it is. So uh, maybe in quantum chains, I mean, we only find diffusive behavior. Now I have a co-worker which, um, you know, is, is very good in these numerical things and, and, and so he knows how to do this ETMRG and all that this, such kind of stuff which I sort of wouldn't know how to even touch. But, uh, but, but he's very good at this and so, so, you know, we have been sort of, uh, um, you know, he's at the moment, he's in Dresden, I mean, so, you know, a lot of discussions and so I asked him whether he could do, compute for me the density-density correlation um, in, in a simple system, and so we, I guess here I put hardcore bosons. I mean, you can also think uh, bosonic uh, uh, Hubble chain, and, and, and we took three states per side, right? I mean, zero, one, two. And uh, this, the system size is roughly one, 100, maybe in some simulations 150, and, and we're working at infinite temperature, which is sort of the easiest case. And so, so, so now you see the 2018 versions of, of the pictures with, with, which Uli showed you, which was sort of like, you know, a little much, much earlier, and, and so, so this is what you find. So, uh, you know, these are uh, just almost perfect Gaussian peaks, right? So, so, so the idea that, that when, 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 when I, I take a quantum chain uh, and I mean, I, you know, zero temperature might be something different, but then if I look at some finite temperature, I mean, not too low temperature, um, you know, there, there are no sound peaks, and, and you will see diffusive peaks, and, you know, they broad like, like square root of t. And of course, you know, there are numerical simulations and uh, limitations, and so, so, you know, you cannot go to much longer times and all these kind of things. But I think that the numerical evidence is... is, is, is very clear, and then and everybody who works in the area is sort of, you know, even without these pictures, is very much convinced that this is what happens. Okay. Now, of course, you might have several conserved quantities, but then, you know, the assertion is just still the same. I mean, then, of course, you, you know, you, you have now two quantities, but, and, and, but, 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 but each, you know, it will be a two by two matrix, but each matrix element will, will sort of expand like, like a Gaussian, right? All right, so. Bad news, okay? No propagating waves, no KPC, nothing. Okay, and so, so, so the last thing uh, uh, which, which I want to explain to you is that, that uh, uh, life is actually a little bit more complicated 
And in fact, there is, there is sort of a somewhat subtle way of, of, of how, to, uh, how to escape this. But unfortunately, sort of, it's a little bit subtle. And, and, uh, and, and whether we can actually sort of really implement this uh, numerically, I mean, we, we don't know. And, and uh, the, you know, I mean, experiments sort of seem to be even, you know, further apart. But, but I thought the mechanism is sort of of general interest. And so, so uh, here, Uli, I want to show you this picture. I mean, so here. This is the version of, of, of what you showed before. I mean, you know, just a little bit later. Okay, so now, now I want to come to this sort of, uh, so, so, you know, again, I mean, I, I, I don't want to make it too specialistic. So I just want to emphasize that, that there, there are some general features which, which I think actually is interesting and which one should look out for and, and which I think is, is, is much more general beyond the specific example which I'm trying to tell you. And, and, uh, and, but it, it's that case which we have studied. So actually we have studied two things. We have studied classical spins where we see the same phenomena, but, but you know, I want to keep the material sort of short. And, and, uh, and uh, we have studied uh, in, in equal detail, uh, I mean, the discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So uh, the two slides which I'm going to show you are actually for the DNLS, OK? So this you should think of, of sort of like, like um, uh, you know, uh, a semi-classical limit of, of, uh, of a bosonic field theory, right? I mean, that's basically what it is, OK? So it's on the lattice. I mean, if I would put this model uh, on the continuum, then it would become integrable, and it has a totally different behavior, OK? So, so now, now what do you do? Well, I mean, so here, here uh, uh, I've written down the Hamiltonian. So here, so, so psi will be a complex-valued field. I mean, sort of your wave field, you know, wave function, if you want, so it's a wave field. Um, uh, uh, so at each lattice side, I have one of these variables, and, and this is sort of the usual kinetic energy, and then there's a nonlinearity, which is psi to the power 4, right? And the tree is, is uh, positive, which is usually called the defocusing case. So if I, if I would put, you know, non-trivial commutators, then I'm to a quantum field theory, but here, you know, these are classical variables, and so, so it's sort of like a classical limit of this. Now, the canonical conjugate variables are psi and psi star, and so if you write down the equations of motion, I mean, you know, according to this prescription, I mean, of course, here you find simply, so you have the i and you have simply the Laplacian, and then you have the nonlinearity, which you would expect, I mean, just the derivative of this object, which is psi j, absolute value times psi j. So this is the evolution equation for this nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Okay, now, now I follow again the prescription. I mean, you, you, you can write down, uh, 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 there are two conserved quantities, I mean, uh, energy and, and density. Up here, I can write down the e to the minus beta h. Uh, I mean, in this case, they are a little bit coupled, so you have to work a little bit more on, on the phase diagram and things like this. But uh, anyway, that's not, not very hard. But um, uh, if you write it like this, I mean, you don't find any intuition. And so, so the good way is actually to, to in introduce sort of like, uh, you know, going to, to uh, polar coordinates. And then here I put the square root because then this transformation is really sort of uh, uh, canonical, so, so I have amplitude and phases, and I can rewrite this Hamiltonian in terms of amplitude and phases. But remember that once I have done this, co this coordinate transformation, you know, it, it, I will have boundary condition. I, you know, I must make sure that, 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 uh, that the phi is really sitting on the circle, and then there's a boundary condition at zero. So, so you know, when I write down the equations of motion, there are really boundary conditions. Anyway, so you do this transformation, and what you find is sort of uh, something quite simple. I mean, you know, you, you find a coupling, which is now the, now the cosine. So, you know, you can have a nearest neighbor coupling between neighboring uh, faces. And, 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 and here you have like an on-site potential. And, and I smuggled in this chemical potential. And you see that, that if I put the chemical potential sort of in the right way, I mean, if I make this with this sign sort of very large, I mean, you see that it's actually sitting in a Mexican head. Now, of course, we are in one dimension. There will be no phase transition. But dynamically, I mean, you will see this. And um, um, uh, uh, let's see. I just want to show what I want to. Yeah. So, so now, now I'm still, still looking at this, at this equilibrium uh, distribution. And, and so you see that um, if I make this at high temperatures, so, so, so you know, I'm, I'm very far away above this Mexican head. I mean, then I will get just a uniform distribution of phases and, and, uh, and uh, sort of completely disordered behavior. But if I'm now making you know, the temperature very, very small, and if I impose the constraint that the, that the average length of these fields should be equal to 1, then the typical configuration will sit at the minimum of this Mexican head. So you know, if, I, if I look at one typical equilibrium correlation, then 
you know, this will be maybe one value and that's the next value and it's sort of from side to side it will just change very, very little. So it will make sort of like a diffusion, diffusion in, inside the Mexican head. But to actually tunnel, you know, outside the Mexican head or to tunnel from here to here, I mean, that's sort of, you know, very, extremely unlikely. So now dynamically, this is reflected by, by looking at what people call the umklapp. And this is sort of basically saying that, that you know, I look at these phase differences and, and you know, I look when, whenever the phase, so maybe I should, should show this. Uh, um, you see that, you know, the, the phases have this cosine potential. And so, so, so the umklapp means that basically, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's sort of like an inverted cosine. So, so if I take, uh, this value to be plus minus phi, then I'm sort of going over 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 the barrier in the Mexican head. I mean, okay, and so uh, so you see that, um, uh, uh, yeah. So 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 I have these umklapp processes, which which sort of uh, if you define them dynamically means that that uh, I have this this plus minus phi now. And of course, there's nothing drastic happening. I mean, you know, it's just sort of continuing on the other side. But the point is that this event at small temperatures is extremely unlikely. And so what you discover is that when I look at phase differences at, zero, at small temperatures, they will have be almost conserved. So you see, your naive computation of conservation laws was certainly correct, but they completely missed this feature. And so uh, the point is that, that the phase diagram is sort of slightly more interesting, namely if I'm going so maybe not at zero temperature, but at some intermediate temperature, then I discover that the, the phase differences actually are, are uh, almost conserved. You know, I mean, certainly, you know, I mean, they, of course, you know, they, they decay with, with, with very, very slowly decaying exponential, but, but, you know, the weight is so extremely small that, you know, it, it's, it's way, way beyond what you can reach numerically. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's really, you know, it behaves just like a conserved quantity. Now, conserved quantity, basically, if I really want to make it conserved, you know, rather than sort of continuing periodically, I would just simply reflect that the two boundaries of my cosine potential, you see, what I would do is, if I really want to make the perfectly conserved model, I mean, what I would do is I have here this cosine, inverted cosine, uh, I mean, something, something like, like uh, well, if I sort of maybe something like this, okay, and of course the umklapp goes across, but then I can put here a sort of infinite barrier and then simply let it reflect. And if I do this, then I get a model which, which has truly three conserved quantities, and it's this model which correctly describes sort of the, the low, I mean, not very low, but low temperature behavior, okay? So now I am in shape again, because, you know, that's exactly the type of Unharmonic chains, which I discussed, of course, you know, slightly different variables, and then and, and, uh, sort of, but but the abstract structure is very similar. In particular, what I find is that there will be non-zero true the weight. Okay, so now the prediction is that when I look at this discrete nonlinear Schrödinger equation at high temperatures, I will see the diffusive peaks, just as we have seen in in in, in the Bose-Hubbard model. But when I go to to in the low temperatures, I mean not very low, but low temperatures, then suddenly there will be like an extra conserved quantity and uh, these phase differences are conserved and they produce for you uh, uh, sound peaks which are propagating. Okay, and so I think I now have, uh, yes, yeah, so this, this is a numerical simulation and so, so the origin is sitting somewhere over here and here you see the sound peak propagating and, uh, and uh, uh, of course, I mean, you know, here, it's just sort of one, one, one particular simulation. I mean, we analyze more precisely how this broadens. And, um, and uh, you know, as you would expect from the theory, it broadens like t to the two-thirds. And you look at the shape, and you find that it's very well approximated by, you know, what I called FKPC. I mean, this, this function which sort of has a decay which is somewhat faster than a Gaussian, and, um, okay? So the predictions of, of, you know, what we did for the classical system is also sort of verified in this particular system. Okay, okay so I think, uh, anyway, it's not so bad. I'm a few minutes earlier. Uh, maybe I didn't explain all the details, but, 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 but let me sort of repeat maybe a little bit what, what, what I was trying to say. I mean, so, so, so what, 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 what we would like to understand, uh, you know, are these this non-integrable, I mean, equilibrium time correlations in, in non-integrable quantum spin chains, and, and there's no question that when I look at, at, at high temperatures, or in particular at infinite temperatures, then uh, I just will see the Gaussian peak. However, 
they're sort of like a way out. I mean, you know, I can sort of get, so for instance, one, one model, which, which I think would, would be a good model if I look at uh, an XXC chain with, with, with uh, S different one half, so it it's becomes non-integrable, or maybe I can take also one half chain, but I can sort of break it in a somewhat different way. I mean, introduce next nearest neighbor coupling. Then, uh, then of course, uh, um, um, uh, you know, I still will have only sort of the, the naive uh, two conservation laws. But when I put the parameters of the XXC model in such a way that I'm in the easy plane case, so you know, so, so the coupling has to be made in such a way that that uh, the phase differences want to basically move sort of in the plane orthogonal to this three direction, then this would be the candidate for having sort of like an extra almost conserved quantity. And then sort of KPC theory should apply, and what you should see are propagating sound peaks. If you're lucky, I mean, they, they should have the, the, the KPC behavior. You know, actually, um, Christian actually did simulations, and, and, and I mean, of course, he does find structures which are, which are actually ex sort of like sound peaks. They are expanding in time, but, but, but they are not really sharply, sharply peaked. I mean, you know, the, the, what we see on currently in the numerical simulations is that we have a reasonably well-defined sort of, you know, maybe I should explain this. Um, uh, you know, but, but, but what we see in the, in the simulation, of course, I mean, we, we, we do have here sort of a cutoff, I mean, which goes like CT, minus CT, and plus CT. So now I'm just plotting something like, like, like a density density correlation. So, so out here it's zero, and, and then we have some peaks over here. But, but then, you know, we have sort of like, like whatever, free Delos oscillations or some oscillations in the middle, and then it looks like this. So, I mean, you know, we do have sort of something which is ballistic. I mean, that's the first step. But, but the ballistic, so there is definitely a ballistic component, but the ballistic component so far cannot be really connected to, to, to uh, you know, a sharp sound peak and, and even less to a two-third exponent and, and even less to KPC scaling function. So thank you very much.